Well, good morning, my friends. Welcome to the Aquarium Online Academy. I didn't realize the camera was on. How are you all today? Well, we are going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be learning about fish. Pretty good topic for an aquarium, wouldn't you say? Well, you get to participate. We have a question line right here. Text us at 562-286-1838, and you can ask questions live while we're on the air. Now, make sure you have an adult or somebody around you help you out if you're one of our younger viewers. Text rates do apply, so just keep that in mind. Now, if you have a really, really big question, or maybe you're not watching live Thursday morning, and you want more information, use the email down below, live at LBAOP, and you can email our educators questions too. We have Sarah on a question line. We have Jen controlling all the fun fish pictures behind me. We're going to explore and take a look at fish. Let's take a look at some fish. What do you notice about our blue cavern fish habitat? Hmm. What do you see inside the exhibit? I mean, I see a lot of fish, but what are the fish playing with? And what are they hanging out with? Rocks? Seaweed? Other fish? Yes. <gasps> I found one of my favorite fish of this exhibit. He's hiding. Shh. He's probably in his bed. He likes to sleep on that rock. That is the California sheephead wrasse. Sometimes he's hiding in the kelp, but right now he's just sitting right there on a rock. Now, the reason I can also tell that this is the male sheephead, even though he's really well camouflaged right now, is that it has the three colors, a dark head, kind of pinkish middle, and then a dark tail also. That's how you can tell that's the male sheephead. The females are kind of all one pinkish orange color. So there's a little bit of a difference between some boy fish and some girl fish. But that's not always the way it works. Some of the fish all look the same, like these mackerel right here. There's not really an easy way to tell the difference between male and female, at least from the outside. So fish do have some interesting characteristics. What else do you know about fish? What else do you want to learn about fish? Don't forget to text us if you have questions. Well, let's see. What else do we know about fish? Let me get one of my fish models back up here to help us. Ta-da! Does this fish look like it should live in this habitat? Why not? What do you remember about fish? Well, some fish have to live in cold water like blue caverns. Some fish like to live in tropical water like this angelfish does. But let's talk about some characteristics that all fish have before we talk about where they might live. So what do you notice about this fish? It's got a tail. It's got fins. Lots of fins. Hmm. I see it has eyes like we do. They can see very well in the water. Their eyes are very well adapted or good for survival in the water, at least where there's a lot of light. Do fish have all the same kinds of eyes if it's really, really dark all the time, like the deep ocean? No, one of my favorite fish to look up pictures of is called the barrel eye fish. This is a very interesting fish, very different from what you expect. Its forehead is see-through and its eyeballs only point up. Why would you only want to look up in the air? There might be food up there. That's a good idea. So they only really look for things swimming above them to try and feed from. Eh, that's interesting, pretty cool fish. I recommend you check it out after we're done today. Now this fish also has a gill right here. Bony fish, or fish that have a skeleton made of bones like ours are made of bones, they have one gill opening per side. Oh, all right. I see some scales. You can see the little colors of the scalloping of their scales. So fish have a lot of characteristics. They breathe with their gills. They have fins. Well, some fish don't have as many fins as you think. They have eyes, mouths. Hmm. So that's a pretty good set of characteristics. Let's see if we can figure out which fish match all of this. Now, Evie's asking a question, what does camouflage mean? I'm glad you asked. So if we take a look at an animal, when they are hiding with their colors, they are camouflaging. So the color of our sheep headrest is broken up enough that it can try to hide based off stripes on its body. 
Let's use our other fish friend we had today. Does this one have really cool stripes? It does. Orange and white and black stripes. When you look at something at a really far distance, it's not far enough, but that's okay. Pretend you're looking really, really far away. The stripes make it tougher to see the outline of a fish. So if you're a predator and you're looking for food, but you can't quite tell if it's a fish because you can't quite see a fish shape, that is camouflage. Some animals can change color for their camouflage, like an octopus. Or some animals can change color between night and day to hide. Some of those animals are in our tropical habitat. We'll check some of them out a little bit later too. So camouflaging is hiding with your colors. Could you imagine trying to hide in maybe your room or your backyard or the kitchen? What would you use to hide? What would you use to hide? Hmm. I'd probably try to look like the other things around me. So maybe if I was in my room, I'd hide under some blankets or I'd put all my stuffed animal friends on top of me or I'd hide in the dark. It's harder to see things in the dark. If you're in your backyard, you might try to hide amongst the plants and the trees and the leaves, just like our sand dragon, or not sand, or sea dragon. Our weedy sea dragon has these little appendages that kind of look like fins and arms, but they're really not. It helps it hide among the sea grasses. Sea dragons live in Australia, but they have a very similar climate or yearly weather patterns that we do here in California. So if you imagine what it would be like out in the ocean here, very similar for sea dragons. There's also the leafy sea dragons, and there's a red type of sea dragon too. So there's only three kinds of sea dragon. Here is the leafy sea dragon, even more leafiness on their body. They are really well adapted at hiding in the plants as they very gently swim around. So great question, Evie, about camouflage. Do all fish camouflage? Hmm. I don't know. A lot of fish do. But sometimes they just want to be like, look at me, look at me, don't come near me. That's what this Garibaldi saying. in that exact voice. I don't know, I don't speak fish. But Garibaldi, it's super bright orange, but it would live in a space like Blue Cavern. Would it be really easy to see a super duper orange fish in Blue Cavern? Yeah, it would. So it's not really trying to hide. Now what Garibaldi do is they are territorial and they like to protect a spot in their habitat that's just there. So that's where they get to have their nest of eggs. And the males will protect that area and shoo away anybody else that tries to swim in there, even if it's a person. Now Garibaldi might get about this big, but a person swims by, they'll get right up in your face and try to get you away from their nest. They don't care how big the other thing is, they will try to get them away from that. So sometimes coloring is for warning and to look bigger and scarier or to at least signal to something else, this is my spot, you go get your own spot. Pretty good way to color yourself. Now the cool thing about the juvenile Garibaldi is they're even more brightly colored. What? Why would you want to be even brighter? You're already bright orange, fish. Well, what if there's a way to tell other Garibaldi around you, hey, it's okay. I'm not going to actually bother anything. I'm just moseying by. <laughs> Don't me. I'm just passing through. That's what juvenile coloring or little kid coloring on the Garibaldi's for is to help signal to other fish, hey, I don't actually mean any trouble. I'm just passing by. It's fine. And the adult Garibaldi just kind of let them go without bothering them. But oh, another fish comes by. Oh, get out of my space. And that's what the colors help them signal. Pretty cool. All right. River asked a great question. What kinds of food do fish eat? Do you think fish like to eat donuts and ice cream and popcorn? Probably not. Fish like to eat lots of things that they live near. So some fish are going to be herbivores. Some fish are carnivores. And some do both. So herbivores only eat plants and algae. Carnivores only eat other animals to get energy. And then an omnivore, om nom 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 nom, they eat everything. They can eat plants and animals. So let's think of some fish in what they eat. Now, Jen's going to give us a picture of a fish. Let's see if we can figure out what it might eat. But it kind of depends on a couple things. Do they have teeth? 
where, where direction is their mouth pointing? So if you take a look back at our friend right here, their mouth points kind of forward. So they have to go to their food. If their mouth pointed up, they'd have to go up to their food, or they have to catch their food above them. If their mouth points down, they have to grab it from something underneath them. So what direction does this fish mouth point? You look might look like he's frowning, but he's not really frowning. He's a very happy frogfish. The mouth points up, so they're going to try and ambush something that gets above them and down close enough to their face. Do you see any really big teeth on this fish? No, not really. The frogfish has a special way to hunt. It's an ambush predator, meaning it will try and wait long and still, waiting for something to come by. And then if it gets close enough to its face, it'll swallow the whole thing whole. They can eat a fish almost as big as itself. That's how cool their method of eating is. So if you had to wait for food to come near you, would you just eat plants and algae? It doesn't really travel around the ocean that well. So you probably have to eat other animals. But there's some fish that eat just plants and algae, like a butterfly fish. So we're going to say in the tropical spaces, this frogfish would be a tropical fish, eats other animals, waits for them to get close, ambushes them, waits until they don't realize it's there until it's too late, and then they get swallowed for food. But some butterfly fish, like these, they're only going to eat the algae that grows on the coral. So I'm going to grab a piece of coral. If you want to get, oh, here's another one. This is a, another butterfly fish. If you wanted to eat the algae that was in between all these little pieces of coral, if you had a really big, wide face, it's not easy to get in the little spaces. So if you have a skinny mouth or an elongated one like that long-nosed butterfly fish does, you can get in between the little cracks and crevices and munch on the algae that's growing on top of the coral. So some animals have to eat the coral or the algae off the coral for the coral to be healthy. Other fish have really big honking teeth for eating the coral, like a parrotfish. What a cute smile. Parrotfish have these really large teeth that allow them to eat the decaying stuff around the coral and sometimes the coral bodies that are in there. But they take little chumps, chumps of coral off, but they need these really strong teeth in order to get into it. Now, really fun, gross fact about parrotfish is they help make the white sandy beaches that we have. So in a tropical area, some of the white sand on those beaches comes from the coral that the fish was eating. Now, it's not going to eat the coral, crunch it up and spit the coral out. It actually has to pass through their digestive system and they poop it out. That's nature. That's how it works. But our beaches here aren't like that. Now, we don't have any parrotfish that live locally. So our sandy beaches that are in California are from the wave action breaking down the rocks and eroding them into sand, but also people make the sand and put it on the beach so we have enough beach material that we can play on. All right, now Maya asked, what is the long skinny fish that was in Blue, Blue Cavern? <gasps> Maya, that's a really cool question because he's one of my favorite fish in Blue Cavern. Now, as Jen puts that back up, we're going to take a look at the skinny fish that are in there. This long skinny fish has a long body, kind of like a paper towel tube. So that long skinny body is kind of rigid. So it's not like an eel where it has a long skinny body and kind of does this. The barracuda in Blue Cavern is got a more rigid body, so it needs its fins to swim around. Now, Jen's trying to find a good image of the barracuda in there because if he's not visible, it's hard to talk about him. So we have one Pacific barracuda in here. Where he likes to swim around this zone right here. Let's see if he swims by. He should be popping up soon. But while we're watching in Blue Cavern, it is a type of barracuda. Some barracuda are often found. There he is. Woo! Are often found in a school or a group of barracuda. But they can be by themselves. As you can see, our barracuda here is by itself. Also, the great barracuda will sometimes school together. But we've had one, bar one great barracuda by itself before, too. So Barracuda can school. He's not going to be in here because this is in the past. This is other fish, though. So this is the same habitat. But this is a different view of some of the other fish. Where'd that giant sea bass just suddenly come from? 
Just like, wrong. They're really interesting fish. They actually are very social with each other in here. And one of the things that's happening is, I think this is the boy, and it's flirting with the girl. And it just did it again, like, wrong. what are you doing? But we have three giant sea bass in Blue Cavern, two males and one female, and they love to hang out with the camera when they're down at the bottom of the exhibit, as you can see. But what is different between the barracuda and this fish? So barracuda might school just like those sardines would school. They're all going the same direction. They're hanging out together. Are these fish schooling? No, they're just kind of hanging out, doing whatever they want to, but they might be in the same area. That's called shoaling. So shoaling is, let's imagine when you're all in a room with your family or friends, you're not really going the same direction. So now we're back to present time blue cavern. Like these fish are schooling. They're all swimming one way. But if they were all just hanging out in one space, it's not really doing anything, but everybody's like, oh, we know what, we should go outside. And everybody just kind of goes outside. Then you're all still doing whatever you want. That is shoaling. So schooling and shoaling are grouping of fish. So some fish have the adaptation to group together to protect themselves so that if I were a predator and I was trying to get just one of them, maybe I wouldn't be able to. It doesn't really look like one fish. It looks like a blob of fish. Or the shiny skin that they have, the shiny scales, prevent me, the predator, from really easily seeing where there's one fish. So schooling and shoaling is a really good adaptation. Evan asked, why do parrotfish change colors? Oh, well, Evan, we'll get back to our parrotfish picture. The parrotfish that I know of don't really change colors too much, but they do make a sleeping bag at night to sleep in. What if you had to make a sleeping bag every night? Man, that's, you don't want to carry it around the whole time. So instead of just leaving it behind, you ate it for breakfast. That's what parrotfish do. They make this kind of mucus sleeping bag that helps protect them from parasites. And then in the morning, they will eat it so that they aren't really wasting the energy of making it. So some fish that are tropical do change color from day to night. As far as I know, it's not this one. But there are some that do change colors from day to night. And the example would be like a fox face rabbit fish. This fish will go from a bright yellow and white and black colors to darker colors to hide in the coral at night. So rabbit fish are really good at this, but also there's a lot of tropical fish that do this. If you ever have a chance to either hang out at a coral reef at night or watch pictures or videos of people that were, the fish that were brightly colored in the daytime will be very dark colored at night. Now Carl and Walter asking, what happens, what happened to the frogfish's skin? I don't know, let's find out. Nothing happened to it. That's what they look like. That what, It doesn't look like a fish skin to you? Well, fish have different kinds of scales to be in, between different kinds. Now, the cool thing about frogfish is that sometimes they grow seaweed and algae on their body. You don't want to grow seaweed and algae on you? Well, what if you had to sit still all day and hide to wait for food to come to you? You need to camouflage like Evie was asking about. So sometimes... The little algae grows in their body. Other times they just have kind of bumpy, lumpy skin like this. So that way they can hide and not look like a fish. And when their prey comes too close, mm, they get to have a meal. So their skin is just gonna be really different compared to other fish that have really nicely defined scales like an angelfish does. Let's take a look at a real angelfish. We have a picture of a semicircle angelfish that has a very special color around its gill opening. Now the gill opening is called an operculum. So on the operculum, there's this line that looks like somebody drew a half circle on its face. On a fish, that's okay. Now the semicircle angelfish, if you look here, it'd be right around here. So right around on their face. Now there's another angelfish over there. What do you notice about angelfish? We can also use my friend here, the stuffed animal model, their fins are different. So a lot of different fish have different shapes and sizes of fins. Did that frogfish have really big fins? They're almost paddle-like, like feet almost too. That's because they need to walk around and sit on the floor. They're not really swimming anywhere. But if you're a swimming type of fish, you're going to need a tail 
your dorsal fins, which dorsal means on your back, and your ventral fins, those are the ones on your belly side. And then you have these. Boop. These are your pectoral fins. Now, different fish swim different ways. Some fish use their tail to push. Some fish, like this bird grass right here in the corner, they use their side fins to push, and their tail is what helps them steer. So different fish also swim in different ways. Hmm. Are there fish that have no fins? There are. Hmm. Let's take a look at an eel. Now, some true eels do have a couple of little fins like they do. They are a true eel, but they do have a couple of tiny little fins right here. This is called a garden eel. Now, it's not as big as I am. They're actually only about that big, about as big around as your finger, too. So they're not super big eels, but they are true eels. They just have really tiny, almost invisible fins right here. But then there's other fins like moray eels, like this one. What a cute face. They don't have any true fins. This spot right here is their gill opening or their operculum. It just doesn't have a plate, hard plate on top of it like our uh, angelfish friends do, the giant sea bass or even the barracuda. It has a soft opening right here to allow the water that they suck in their mouth to pass right out their gills. Now eels do have big teeth, long and skinny, and they even have a second set of jaws. So they have the regular teeth right here, then they have some back in their throat to help them eat their food. They don't have hands, so they can't just keep shoveling the food in, so they have two sets of teeth. One grabs the food, and as they swallow, the other set of teeth help pull the food into their mouth so they can just keep chomping on their food and swallowing their fish whole. It's actually pretty fun to watch an eel eat. And when I was a volunteer aquarist, a person that takes care of our fish, I got to feed the eels, and I had to use salad tongs because we don't want to get bit by the fish, so I'd hold the fish out for them, and they would grab it, and without even looking like they're chewing on the fish, the fish would just get swallowed whole. That's a pretty impressive adaptation. All right. Well, there's a group of fish we haven't talked about yet that might not seem like they're fish, but they're fish. Let's take a look at the other kinds of fish. So these, all the fish we've been looking at so far have a bony skeleton like we do. We have skeletons made of bone. Yeah. But there's other fish that have a cartilage-based skeleton. Where do we have cartilage in our bodies? Right here. This part right here. This part up here. And actually in between a lot of our bones that move, we have cartilage. But the sharks and rays have an entire skeleton made of cartilage no hard bones, which makes them really flexible and lighter weight compared to a fish of equal size. So that's a cool adaptation too. Now a giant sea bass could get about five to seven feet, maybe five, 600 pounds. But if you were a bony fish, that's pretty heavy. But if you're a shark at that size, you'd be much lighter weight because the heavy bones are only in bony fish, whereas they have a lightweight cartilage skeleton. Carl asked, do fish have ears? Yes, they do. Where are the ears on this fish? Where are the ears on this fish? Well, they don't have ears like we do, but they do have the ability to hear. And their sense of sound is actually very strong underwater. Sharks and rays have a very strong sense of sound. They can hear things from a very, very long distance away. Now, the cool thing is if you've ever had this, uh, tried this, maybe if you were in the bathtub or if you were in a pool, Sounds sound differently underwater because water is much more dense than air, meaning the same amount in the same space is heavier. So if I had a glass of water versus a glass of air, the glass of water is heavier, right? That's because all the par particles of water are closer together, making it kind of thicker. And so water will transmit sound faster and farther than in the air. Now this is great for other animals that speak long distance like whales. Their sounds can be heard for hundreds of miles. But for fish, they're not really talking to each other, but they do need to listen. They'll listen for their prey. Some fish do make kind of grumbly noises, kind of like growly noises to signal to others that there's food in the area, but they're not trying to speak long distance like a whale would. Now, River asked, how do fish have babies? Well, the sharks and rays have many ways to do it. The bony fish are mostly having eggs. So they lay their eggs. Some 
bony fish do have live birth. The baby had a yolk sac attached to it, but it was growing inside of mom or the dad, depending on if you're a seahorse or not. And then they are hat or like birthed out of the mom without the yolk sac. Now sharks and rays kind of do all the above. Some have live birth, some lay eggs, and some sharks and rays do both or a little bit of a combination. So this is actually a shark egg with a shark in the egg. Shark eggs are not like bird eggs that we think where they're big and round. Shark eggs are often kind of flat. The horn shark egg kind of looks like a little football, but it's still not quite like a bird egg shape. But this shark egg, it's kind of flat. You can see the little fins right there, and there's the head. So they'll lay the eggs, and they actually just leave the eggs after they lay them. They don't stick around to wait for them to hatch. And that's okay. That's just how some animals have babies. That's actually how a lot of fish take care of eggs, is they actually just lay the eggs and leave. Other fish do what we call brooding, where they hold on to the eggs and wait for them to hatch, and then they let them go. Some eggs brood in their mouth. Could you imagine being the daddy fish, and you're holding all of the eggs in your mouth, just waiting for them to hatch? Or if you're a seahorse, the dad gets the fertilized eggs from mom and holds them in their pouch in their belly and waits till they hatch, and then they pop out. So there's a lot of ways that animals in the ocean can have babies. It's actually a pretty interesting process. Okay. Now one of my favorite fish to show a picture of that we haven't shown yet is the swordfish. I really love this picture because this is not something that was taken way off outside of California or a picture that we, we had to find and buy so that we could show it to you. This picture was taken by our staff on a whale watch. This is a swordfish that was breaching through the water while we are out looking for whales. Now what's different about this fish compared to all the others we've seen today? Their fins are very different, aren't they? Their colors are very different. They're mostly white with a little bit of dark coloring on the back. And you can't quite see it because their nose is in the water, but they got a really long nose like a sword. The sword nose helps them be more aerodynamic or swim faster in the water. They can swim about I think 40 miles an hour, which is kind of like driving through neighborhoods, or actually not inside your neighborhood, that's actually too fast, outside the neighborhood like you're going to the store. It's kind of like that speed, not quite on the highway, but they're still really, really fast. They're one of the fastest bony fish in the world. I think marlins are faster, but swordfish are still pretty fast. And their body's adapted to swim extremely quick to catch their food. Now they don't poke their food with their nose because they have hands to get it off. Like if you roast hot dogs, but you didn't have hands to grab the hot dog off, how do you get the hot dog? Don't do that with the hot dog. So instead, their nose is for helping swim quickly, but their mouth right there is underneath. So they have to catch their food, chase after it, and grab it. So some fish have really crazy looking bodies, but they're really, really cool. It's different than what we expect our standard fish to look like, something like this. But fish have lots of different kinds of bodies, lots of different colors, lots of different styles of finding food, having babies, colors, all the different things. And that's because nature's really, really fun, and there's a lot of variety in nature. There's, I think, 30,000 different kinds of fish in the world, all kinds of fish. So there's a lot of species of fish, and I don't even have any time to talk about all of them because we're almost out of time. But let's go back to one of our webcams and we'll let Jen pick whichever one she wants. And we'll make some last minute observations. Let's just see if we can find the things we've learned about so far, the characteristics of fish, and see what might be in our webcam. Now, don't forget, if you still have more questions or if you're watching after we're live, you can email us those questions at live at lbaop.org. We're also gonna have a program at 11, one and two o'clock today. If you want to wait till this afternoon at two o'clock, we're going to do a fish dissection. We're going to be opening up a fish that is not alive anymore. It is not the prettiest thing. So if you're kind of grossed out by stuff, don't watch that one. Instead, you can watch a webcam like this. Here's our shark lagoon. So we have all the different kinds of fish, the bony fish and the cartilage fish. Remember cartilage skeleton like that one, a shark has cartilage like our nose. Then we have these bony fish in the background. Watch how they swim. Do they all swim in the same way? They all look like they're using their tail right now. But some fish will use these fins to push and their tail to steer. 
There's a little one that's about the size of my pointer finger that's in here called a ras. Remember, the bird ras does this. Well, that little one in here does the same thing. You just are going to be very hard to find it because he's very small. So he's there. Oh, that one was doing it. Ooh, that one's flapping. The stingray's kind of flapping too. So all fish swim the same way. Lots of fish have different colors and shapes and sizes. And then there's a sea turtle. Not a fish, but still really fun. Hello, sea turtle. Okay, well, we're out of time. So we'll let you have some fun watching our webcam for a few seconds. Don't forget to check out our 11, 1, and 2 o'clock programs. We're going to be talking about octopus next. And then this afternoon, we've got our fish dissection. And what else do we have? I don't remember. Our 1 o'clock program will be fun. I guarantee it. But, all right. It's going to be talking about wetlands with fish and birds. Even more stuff. Okay, have some fun, my friends.